Jesus. Amen. You may take your seats. Thanks, you. I have some friends of mine who are going through uh, major medical issues, especially the husband. And I, a couple of weeks ago, because we've been texting back and forth for many months, and Jeff and I got a chance somewhere before Christmas to go visit with them and pray with them. And, and I came to this. This is what hit me. I just said to her, every time I think of you, I will pray in the Spirit. And I have done that all the way along. And so maybe as Pastor Beck said this morning, when you watch the news, when you see what comes up on your Instagram feeds, and sometimes we're very quick to comment back, and we see what's happening in our world, we see the starvation that's going on in Africa and places, and sometimes because we feel we can do nothing, we do nothing. And there may be chances to give, I don't know, but we can pray. And we can pray in the Holy Spirit. You know, in Daniel, in Daniel 9, he comes before the Lord, he sees the sin of the nation, he sees the sin of the city, and he begins to repent. And, he's, and then he goes, oh, Lord God, hear our prayers. Hear our requests that we pray. Not because of our righteousness, not because of anything we've done or how good we are, but because of your great mercy. Yeah, yeah. And so as you look at the TV screen, just say, Lord, have mercy. Yeah. Just begin to pray mercy. Begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. And allow the Holy Spirit just to take of those prayers. Today we're going to continue through John 2 and 3, and if you have your journals there, if you didn't get one last week, they are out there. And it's an opportunity each week as we go through John 2 and 3, there's a, every day you're going to have a different, um, every day you can have a different uh, reflection. One of the things that hit me out of John 1, John 1 was that when Jesus comes to uh, John and Andrew and they ask Jesus questions. Jesus said to them, come and see. Or come and be where I am. Come with me. And so they went with him and they spent time with him where Jesus was. And so the invitation is to you and me today. Jesus says, come with me. Come and see. Come and be with me. Come and draw from me. Come and spend time with me. Don't just wait till a Sunday. I want to I be with you. And so each day there's a different reflection. There's a lecto dominion. Uh, Davinia there, you can take notes. And again, as we're reading through, John, allow the Holy Spirit uh, just to speak to you. And Beck last week said that we're not trying to go through every verse. We're coming from 30,000 feet. And so this morning, I'm going to zero in on one story on, in John 2, and then two, two very short things out of John 3. As we learned last week, John has seven signs, seven IMs, seven days. The whole gospel sees everything in light of Jesus. John illuminates who Jesus is to us, who he is, his character, his mission, his ministry. It's all about Jesus. He's the light in the darkness. He's the lamb of God or he's the scapegoat. They would take two goats and they would put, the, they would put their, like, their sins upon the goat and one goat would be sent over here as a sacrifice, and the other goat was sent off into the wilderness to take their sins away. So when, John to, when Jesus turns up with John, he comes out of the wilderness. And so they knew about the lamb, they knew about the scapegoat, and John points and goes, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the word. He's the lamb of God, he's the son of God, he's the Messiah, he's the true light. It's the word became flesh, came into our neighborhood, into our lives. He comes to live in us, dwell with us. He wasn't called from heaven. He came from heaven to be with us. And so I'm going to read to you this morning. I think it'll come up on your screen. I'm going to try. I'm going to read to you out of the uh, NIV this morning. We're going to read the first uh, 11 verses. And as you read this, see, we're, we're reading this. You either have read it before, you know the story. We're reading this knowing what Jesus has done and who Jesus is. But the people in this story have no idea who he is. They have no idea what he's going to do. And so as John tells the story, try and put yourself in that story, not from, yeah, well, we know the story, know what happens, as if you're one of the people there that are at this wedding and you have no idea who this man is with his six disciples and you have no idea 
who he is, he's the son of God, and you have no idea what he's going to do. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding when the wine was gone. The wine has run out. And Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, Jesus replied, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you or whatever he says to you, do it. Nearby stood six large water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding somewhere between 20 and 30 gallons or somewhere probably between 80 and 115, 120 litres each. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, we kind of like forget that they, dip, they filled the water, as he said, but then he says to them again, now draw some of that water and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that he that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the, the, the bridegroom aside and said, everybody brings out the choice, the best wine first. And then when the, the cheaper wine, or after all the guests have had too much to drink or they're drunk, but you have saved the best till now, or you have saved the best till last. This is the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed. Thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him, or the disciples believed in him. The wedding probably was on a Tuesday. It was three days. Um, they would do their wedding on the third day, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It's interesting because a lot of the theologians talk about that's taken from Genesis and the story of creation in Genesis 1. Uh, in ancient Judaism, you'll read that even in your Passion Translation if you have notes and commentaries. The third day of creation is the only day that God says it is good twice. He says it twice on day three. The day was considered to be twice blessed. The third day, Jesus was resurrected from death to life. And so now they're at this wedding that will go probably take place over numerous days. It's not like we're at a wedding and then the afternoon and then you all go home again. This is going to go for a day, possibly even a week. His mother, Mary was there along with Jesus and probably at this time, at least five of his disciples, some would say even not, if not six, were there with him. There was, the, there was the two who were following John the Baptist. You'll read that earlier. You'll read that in chapter one. Andrew, and we assume the other one is John. Andrew goes get his brother Simon Peter. Then Jesus has an interaction with Philip. He goes gets Nathaniel. And if John brought his brother James, the sons of thunder, there would have been six disciples there. The wedding would have gone on for several days. It's centered around food, it's centered around celebration, it's, it's, it's obviously not much sleep as well, and, and centered around wine. They ran out of wine. The young newlyweds, this would have been a great embarrassment because we're only day one into the wedding that could last for seven. And it's not like here, you just hop in your car and go down to the, go down to the store or even ring it up and ask them to deliver it to you. They, they couldn't go get any more wine. To us, it's not a big deal, especially if you don't drink wine or you're not interested in it. To us, it's not really a big deal, but this is great embarrassment. This is for them to have run out of wine and all the guests are there. I believe that if, that, if, that, that if we do drink, and whether you agree or not, we do everything we do, is we do in moderation. We certainly don't do things to excess. That includes drinking, that certainly includes eating and anything else that goes with it. I understand that if you've come from an alcoholic family that uh, I understand what, that the things you would have gone through would steer you very clear of that altogether. Maybe you, you, you could be in it and don't believe in it, and some of people do believe you can drink, so we're not going into that whole argument. Ephesians 5 says, do not get drunk with wine. If you do drink, do not get drunk with it. Don't allow it to overtake your senses, but to be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. 
Mary says to Jesus, they've run out of wine. There's still another three, four, maybe five days to go. I've been to a, a wedding where we ran out of food, but that's another story. <laughs> All names will remain anonymous even on screen so as to not embarrass the couple. And it was many years ago. Had they invited too many? Had they undercated? Were they expecting that Jesus would bring six with him? Not only had they run out of wine, but it's interesting, the Scripture makes note that when Jesus turned the water into wine, it makes note of the quality of the wine. You have left the best to last. Unusual. Wine in Scripture entailed celebration, joy, blessing, fruitfulness. One of the commentaries that I read and one of the commentaries in the Passion Translation will make the comment, we could interpret Mary's words today as, as we have run out, our religion has failed, the very, this, this whole religious system has run out of who we've run out, our joy has run out, our life has run out. Running out is a picture of how the joy of this world runs out, it fades away. So traditional religion cannot change or gladden our hearts, only Jesus can. They've run out. Wine in the Old Testament was a symbol of, uh, of grapes. Remember the 12 spies, they went into the land of Canaan, Canaan and they, they brought back all these clusters of grapes. This is a land of milk and honey. This is a land of abundance, of fruitfulness. It speaks of flourishing. It talks about provision. It talks about blessing. It talks about banquets and feasts. It talks about a new covenant that Pastor Beck talked about this morning. Uh, it's a very interesting scripture in Isaiah because um, not only we, we're talking about a wedding here, but Isaiah talks about hundreds of years before, he talks about a wedding that's going to take place, and you can read it in Revelations 20, 21. He's going to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's going to talk about when the end has come, how God is going to throw a banquet. And it says here, the Lord Almighty will spread a wonderful feast for those who have been redeemed throughout all the ages. That's not the children of Israel. Everybody who's been redeemed to put their faith and trust in Jesus. At the end of the end of the end, God's going to throw a banquet. And he says, the Almighty will spread a wonderful feast for everybody around the world. It will be delicious feast of good food, food with clear, well-aged wine and choice beef. I read that. I went to some other translations. It says aged beef. It says choice beef. And I'm thinking, I love roast beef, but I don't know if that's what it's talking about. I, I didn't go to the Hebrew word to sort it out. But he's talking about God's going to throw a banquet and nothing's going to run out. He says it's going to be of good food with clear, well-aged wine and choice beef. And in that day, at this banquet, he will remove all the clouds of gloom. He will remove all the shadows of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all the insults and mockery against his land and against his people. The Lord has spoken. And then listen to this. And then Isaiah goes, and in that day, the people who have been redeemed, they will proclaim, this is our God. We have trusted in him and he has saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. There's going to be a marriage supper of the land, let alone a wedding where only a few are invited, where God is going to throw out a feast. And we, the redeemed of the Lord, will stand before him and we will declare. We won't be worried about the things that worried us down here. We will declare this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us and brought us salvation. It's a symbol of his blood as we took the cup this morning, of what Jesus has said for us. There is no forgiveness. There is no cleansing without the shedding of blood. Our garments, though stained, though red with crimson, he has washed whiter than snow. I'm not telling you to go out and stock up on wine or even go drink wine or to get drunk on wine but I am telling you to come to the source of all life 
and let him, Jesus, fill your life. Maybe today for the first time or for those that are serving him already. Let me ask you this question. Is he filling your life afresh? Because there's many things that fill our lives. What is filling your life? Who is filling your life? Is it Jesus? I don't want to, we can say that and sound too spiritual, but yet we can be in conversations with one another and the very thing that is consuming us, either what's happening or what's happening in our world, is the very thing that will just pour out of us and yet there's sometimes nothing of Jesus that comes out of us. Nothing. It's the last comment on wine, I think. One of the commentaries that we, we use is by Warren uh, Wiesby, W-I-E-R-S-B-E. And I thought he made an interesting comment. It actually stopped me. I actually laughed and then it stopped me. He said, a man who was given to drinking too much once said to me, I can drink after all. Jesus turned the water into wine. To which Warren Reesby replied, if you can use Jesus as your example for drinking, why don't you follow his example in everything else or in everything else, he said. When I read that, I thought, you know what? We justify. I'm doing all this for the Lord, but I justify this area over here or I justify that. Lord, as we go through the Gospel of John, as Jesus is revealed afresh to us, we want to give you our whole lives, every room, every nook and cranny, every, every door. We want to give you every part of us. Mum says to her son, they have a conversation. Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine, implying as if, can't you do something about it? Mary knew who Jesus was. And Jesus says, what's that got to do with me? Was she expecting Jesus to do something about it? She didn't tell him what to do. She just reported the problem. I thought, again, I thought, we tell Jesus what to do sometimes instead of just taking things to him. She's hoping that Jesus will solve the dilemma, the embarrassment, by performing a miracle. And Jesus says, my time, my hour is not yet. And once he does his first miracle, his ministry will be known by all. He's going to be exposed on who he really is. I love it. Mary doesn't argue. We would like to get our view or point across. She just turns to the servants and says, whatever he says to you, do it. Remember, they have no clue who he is. What a powerful statement. Do we live our lives like that? It's interesting, the servants didn't argue either. They just did as they were told. They had no idea what he was going to do. They just did what he said. And what was about to happen is really, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. It's the same with us. Jesus calls us to obey him and follow him. He doesn't explain how he intends to deal with our problems. He just says, give them to me. He doesn't describe the path he's going to take us on. He just says, open up my word, listen for my voice and follow me. We want it, we want it mapped out. We want to have the agenda. We want to know what's going to take place. And when we do that, we get to experience Jesus in our relationship with him on a whole nother level, deeper than if we had figured it out ourselves. It doesn't always make sense. Fill up these pots with water. Obviously, the servants were the first to know, we've run out. And over here is sitting these pots that we use for ceremony or washing, not for holding wine. Six is the number for man. Could represent our methods, our ability. If six times 20, 30 gallon each pot, 80 to 110 litres. Let me ask you this. How long did it take to fill them up? How much hard work? It's not like they just cooked the host of them. They probably carried buckets. And why all this is going on, while the guests that are there, they're watching and they're going, can I please have another glass of wine? And they're watching the servants fill up the pots. How long did that take? How much effort? 
So they're watching them, waiting for wine, fill up the water. What was everybody saying while this was going on? What would you say? What are the waiters doing around here? And wait, what would you say? How would you complain? We want our wine. I mean, it's only day one, and yet you're all over there filling up these pots. Not everybody will understand when Jesus says to you, whatever I say to you, do it. Not everybody will understand what you should do with your life. And, and when you make a stand for Jesus, it'll be opposite to what they think at times. Following him is not always an easy path, but it is a blessed one. Mary says, they've run out of wine, but whatever he says to you, do it. So they did. How did they feel then when Jesus said, go take some of this water and give it to the master ceremonies? Would you take water to him? You're supposed to be taking wine. Are you waiting for him to blast you or yell at you or kick you out or fire you? They did it. Just a simple thing. They did it. It doesn't make any sense. It's still water in their eyes. And the master of the ceremonies was so taken back at the quality, not knowing what had happened, he tasted it and said, you've kept the best to last. That's the picture of this book. The people, the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament writers, David, the writers of the Psalms, didn't go get to experience what you and I did, but we get to experience the best to last, Jesus. That's the whole picture. We've received Jesus. God has saved up the best to last. Hundreds and thousands of years take place with this Old Testament, but God is waiting right at the end. Jesus is going to come, and the best to last will turn up. We have received what all the Old Testament followers were waiting for. And what are we doing with him? He's freed us. He's delivered us. This is our God. You know, Jesus didn't tell them to fill up all the nice, beautiful wine goblets with water and I'll turn it into wine. It's these old pots here that were used for ceremonial washing. Guess what? We're just like the pots. Really? Okay, if we're going out somewhere fancy, we might think we look like a nice wine goblet, but really? And Jesus wants to come and fill your life and change you from the inside out not just at salvation daily. He wants to change us from the inside out. Moses, Warren Weasby says, Moses' first miracle in Exodus 7 was a plague. He turned water into blood, which spoke of judgment. Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine, which spoke of grace. Grace, 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 grace. It's an act of kindness, loving kindness, a miracle. Can, could you imagine? See, so the Scripture doesn't tell us this. Can you imagine what the conversation between that young married couple was? What was the conversation on their first wedding anniversary, second wedding? You remember what Jesus did at our wedding? What was the, what was the conversation now of the waiters who were taken it across? What story would they tell to people? You know what just happened? John says, this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was Jesus' first display of his glory and the disciples believed in him. Pastor Beck talked about the seven signs in John. This is the first one. The second one, we we may look at next week when we do John John 4. The second one is in John 4 when he heals the official son. The seventh sign is the raising of Lazarus from the dead and the eighth, as Pastor Beck referred to, of new life was Jesus' resurrection and the empty tomb. If you keep reading chapter 2 there, uh, we haven't got time. Jesus was talking about, I'm going to destroy the temple in three days. And they're going, what? What are you talking about? It's a building. He was talking about him. I'm going to be raised up after three days that we may believe who he is who sent him. John 1, 11, 13, John says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. 
Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children, sons and daughters of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The disciples believed and put their faith in him. It doesn't take long though, John 12, John says, John says, despite all the miracle signs Jesus did, many people did not believe in him. Amazing, isn't it? Maybe that's you today. We go from belief to I, from unbelief to I believe you, I believe in you, I believe you died for me, I believe you rose again for me, I believe you want to have a relationship with me. I thank God for all the miracles I've received, the miracles I've seen, and some of them are quite outstanding. Miracles point to who Jesus is, but you know what? They don't sustain me. It's a belief that, God, you're real. I see God, (laughs) some of our trips to New Guinea, I just shake my head. We're in the middle of absolute nowhere, GPS can't even find you. And people are singing and dancing before the Lord and thinking, God has to be real. Can't make this up. Miracles point to who Jesus is, but they don't sustain me. You know what does? My daily relationship in walking with him. I want to see miracles. I'm praying for miracles. I believe in miracles. But they don't sustain me. What sustains me is I open up his word. I listen to what he says and I follow him on a day-to-day relationship. I think I've told you this story before. I work with a man. As soon as I started writing this down, I can see his face. I can see him sitting at the desk. I won't say his name. I don't think he's still alive, but I won't say it anyhow. But he believed that Jesus was a good man. Believed that he existed, blah, blah, blah. But that didn't save him because he refused to put his trust and faith in Oh, yeah, I believe he was a good man, but. So that believing is I'm putting my faith and trust, my whole weight on Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to fill our lives daily. Let let me ask you this. If you were Jesus, would you choose a wedding with only a few people at to do your first miracle? It's no different than God turns up at the shepherds when Jesus is born. One at the temple so everyone could see. He chose a wedding just to change people's lives, to impact them, for them to believe in him. He's still changing lives today as we present our vessels to him, our water chairs, our impossibilities, our we dead ends, our end of ourselves. We have run out. Jesus comes in John chapter 3 and he has a conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a, a prominent religious leader among the Jews. He recognized who Jesus was. It's interesting, he goes, no one. Henry, John 12 says many wouldn't believe in him. Here's Nicodemus, a religious leader who says, no one who does miracles like you do unless God's power is with them. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus is like, what? And I go back to my mother's room. Nicodemus came seeking knowledge. Jesus offered him life. He comes to question Jesus about who he was. He comes seeking knowledge. Jesus offered him life. Nicodemus, you must be born again. There must be a change from the inside out. Your heritage of being born Jewish or converting to Judaism, your nationality, does not guarantee you entry into the kingdom of God. You have to have a converted, a changed heart. Not I go to church every week. Not every week I I give money away. It's a radical transformation of the heart that only Jesus can do. It's a spiritual rebirth. So, Lord, we're continually asking for radical transformations of our thinking, of our heart. Beck, if you can come this morning. And then in chapter 3, John the Baptist is now, he's already lost John and Andrew. They were his disciples, and now they've gone to follow Jesus. 
Now his remaining disciples come to John the Baptist, listen to this, and they go, teacher, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one who said he was the Messiah, he's baptizing too. He's moving into our territory. Now everybody is leaving us and they're going to follow him. They were ticked off. Church, we're not in competition with anyone. We're not each other, not another church, not another ministry. We're about his business here. Not compare, we don't compare ourselves to others. Matter of fact, we're just following him and doing what he tells us to do. When Jesus comes to take his church home, we do not go up with our church banners. We do not go up with our Instagram feeds. We go up as his church, washed by the blood of Jesus, chains. The disciples come and they're bothered. Everyone's leaving us. They're going to follow him. John's not bothered. John the Baptist is not bothered at all. He goes, I'm not the Messiah, but I've been sent to prepare the way for him. That's our ministry. Who are you? What are you doing here? We are here to prepare a way for others to encounter him. Matter of fact, we are signposts. I had a conversation with a man this week. Not a Christian. By coincidence, a conversation. And he begins to tell me about his wife and what she's going through and the sickness. And so I'm just sitting there listening. I try to say, Holy Spirit, what do I, I don't want to give some religious answer. And then when our time came to depart, I just said to him, can I pray for your wife? And named her. I may never see him again. I'm believing as I prayed, I'm believing for a miracle. I'm believing that God can use me as a signpost. Next time you drive into your street or down the M5, you might just be a little signpost at your street. The M5's got those great big signs. Every time you drive past one, remember, you're a signpost pointing to Jesus. That's why he's got to fill our lives. We're here to point the way, like John the Baptist, to Jesus Christ. John says, hey, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not bothered by everyone going to follow him. John says, he must increase, I must decrease. The the, the New Living Translation says, he must become greater and greater and greater. I must become less and less, not in like I'm a nothing, but you must become more. As much as I love our church, I love our name, I love you. And as much as we're to invite people here and bring people with us, contact people, we're not pointing to Hope Point Church. Our lives are pointing to Jesus. But if he's not filling my life, if he's not increasing, if I'm not allowing for radical transformations, nothing will happen. Who this week can you bring to Jesus by just pointing a signpost of the way to him? John says, in chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase. I must decrease. Who is filling your life today? What is it? We're going to end this morning as we did yesterday. We had such a beautiful time here yesterday with the seniors as we prayed and just sat through this building praying and just, I'm going to ask if you're able to just to kneel this morning. If if you're not able to do that, just sit in your seat. It's not a problem. We're just going to sing this song we sang yesterday with the seniors. It says, here I am, Lord, here I am. I give all my life to you. Here I am. Here I am, Lord, here I am. Let your Holy Spirit the wine, the joy of the Holy Spirit. Let it work in me. Here I am today. If you're watching online, if you want to join us today, if you're making that decision for the first time of asking Jesus to come in and fill your life, I believe he died for me, rose again for me as a plan for me. 
Today, just saying yes to him and letting someone know, hey, today I made a decision to follow Jesus. I'm asking Jesus to direct my life. I'm asking him to do a radical transformation within me, being born again, not a physical birth, but spiritual birth. Lord, as a church today, as we, we just come to you and just, we just say, here we are, Lord. We don't compare ourselves to anyone else. We're not trying to be anyone else. We're just here to be your church where you've planted us here. And we're asking that you would fill our lives afresh, that you would transform us continually from the inside out and that you would increase in our life so that we're pointing others to you in Jesus' name.